Hello and welcome to Northwest Newsweek Year in Review, Episode 1. 2021 gone off to a very shaky start, like we are now in the cold shadow of the COVID-19 pandemic. But January began to offer a glimmer of hope as a COVID-19 vaccine rollout started for members of our most vulnerable population and for those who care for them when residents and staff at Sulakau's long-term care home began receiving the vaccinations, making it one of the first facilities outside of Thunder Bay to do so. And with that, 85-year-old Eunice Fiddler, the mother of Nan Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler, became the first resident at the William A. George Extended Care Facility to receive a vaccination for COVID-19. Facility Administrator Cynthia Dwyer says after months of tension and concern, watching the vaccinations begin was amazing and a blessing. We have to be diligent. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Be diligent. There's light at the end of the tunnel. And finally, we are now seeing the light. The vaccine arrived in Sulacau Wednesday evening by air and was delivered to the facility by Orange, which has been tasked by the province to deliver vaccines to northern Ontario. For Orange Operations Manager Ron Laverty, this duty hits very close to home. So my mother-in-law is, is a patient in the hospital here and she's one of the at-risk people that's going to be going to receive the vaccination. And it's a relief. It, and it's sort of like the culmination of, for all of us, I mean, all of the people that have worked so hard in the last year due to COVID, all of the changes we've had to make in our lives. And, and this is like, this is a real breath of fresh air. Staff at William A. George were also given their first dose of the Moderna vaccine. That honor went to Tom Chapman, who is an interpreter at the facility. Karen Parent is another one of the key figures involved in getting the vaccine to Sulik out and recalls the moment she got word that the vaccine would be arriving. Oh my goodness, New Year's Eve, let me tell you, that was wonderful. Um, I was just really excited and of course sworn to secrecy between Heather and myself, so it was uh, a little internal celebration. Heather Lee is the CEO of the Menoyawan Health Centre, which runs William A. George. She says a key delivery component is having staff who work in long-term care deliver the vaccine to allow for as smooth of an inoculation as possible. So to be here with people that they know, who care for them day in and day out, who they trust, is really important because when, when we have to go elsewhere or other people are coming in that they don't know, it's a very frightening experience for them and can... Um, can really create some dilemmas for them. Over the next few days, almost 550 doses of the Moderna vaccine will be administered to residents and staff of both the William A. George Extended Care Facility and the Menno Yawin Health Centre, after which it will be a 21-day wait before the second round of inoculations can begin. Adam Riley, TBT News. The reaction to the start of vaccinations in Sioux Lookout was also welcomed by the Medical Officer of Health for the Northwestern Health Unit, was also happy to see a strategic and targeted approach. Dr. Kit Young-Hoon believed vaccinating vulnerable populations like seniors and those who care for them would be an important step in combating COVID. However, when it came to administering vaccines for those not in care homes or other medical facilities, she said it was part of an ongoing conversation with the province, especially on the topic of a steady supply chain of the vaccine. Our case numbers are increasing and they're not coming down at this point. And you know, I don't think we've seen the full effect of what has occurred over the Christmas season. So that the interactions over uh, during the Christmas season is likely still yet to show up in our numbers. Who noted conversations were also being held locally between the health unit and other regional health partners for the best rollout strategy for the rest of the population. In late January, Manitowage was shaken following the murder in, a small, in the small town of 2000 and revelations that the victim and the accused were not just known to each other but shared the same father further rocked the community. OPP were called to a disturbance at a Flicker Street residence on January 25th. Officers attending the scene discovered an 18-year-old male, later identified as Wayne Allen, who was then taken to hospital by Superior North EMS where he was later pronounced deceased. Our officers uh, at the scene arrested a 38-year-old male um, identified as Jesse Allen, uh, who's also a resident of uh, Manitowoc and a relative of the deceased. Mr. Allen, Jesse Allen, has since been charged with uh, first-degree murder, contrary to Section 235, sub 1 of the Criminal Code. Uh, Mr. Allen was also remanded to custody and is currently being held at the uh, Thunder Bay District Jail. 
In February, we brought to you a story of the family of a Dinoric man who were still seeking answers three months after his death was declared a homicide. But few details came from the OPP who admitted the case was very complicated. The victim's wife says the murderer was a neighbor who had been released from custody mere hours after a major wet drugs and weapons arrest. That neighbor would later be found dead in a structural fire next door. A warning, some of the details may be disturbing. 75-year-old Rick McLeod was described as a person who loved life, fishing, and his family. On November 5, 2020, his wife Linda witnessed as he was shot and killed inside their house by their neighbor, 48-year-old Daniel Lethbridge. Dan opened up the door and had shot Rick once. It was, uh, so I kind of ducked because I wasn't sure what was going on. And then Rick had said Linda, and then I went to turn around, and that's when Dan uh, shot him again. McLeod says after shooting her husband, Lethbridge stared at her for a moment before closing the door and exiting the house. It is believed Lethbridge then went over to his own home and set it on fire. The OPP closed the Trans-Canada Highway as officers searched for a shooter, and fire crews attempted to control the blaze. Human remains were later discovered in the ruins, and this week, the OPP confirmed what many have suspected. On February 3rd, well, we uh, had the results come back from the office of the uh, chief coroner, and they positively identified the human remains as 48-year-old Daniel Lethbridge. Uh, Daniel Lethbridge was the person that owned the residence that was engulfed in flames. Despite that confirmation, McLeod says Lethbridge still has not been implicated for her husband's murder. When asked for Rick McLeod's cause of death, Golding says the OPP are withholding that evidence at this time and therefore was unable to confirm that McLeod was shot. His widow is also still wanting answers as to how Lethbridge was allowed to be released from custody. He had been arrested 24 hours prior to the incident following an assault investigation which prompted a search of his home and the police seizure of 19 firearms and over 400 cannabis plants. It's just the whole thing like there's unresolved answers and nobody's really saying anything. We put together a, a case with evidence and it's presented to the uh, to the courts and then they did make the decision on whether or not a person is released. Um, I understand the uh, transparency uh, portion of this doesn't look good, but uh, once again, it's, it's uh, in the hands of the courts. Golding notes the investigation is still ongoing at this time and believes more information will be released in the future. Meanwhile, Linda McLeod is left waiting with just memories and the trauma of what she witnessed. Adam Riley, TBT News. Tragedy struck the North Shore town of Scriber on February 13th following a collision on Highway 17 west of Marathon, which claimed the life of Mayor Dave Hamilton. Hamilton's death was mourned by many local leaders and friends in the days that followed the incident. Police confirmed late in the afternoon on February 14th that the victim of a two-vehicle collision on Highway 17 between Marathon and Terrace Bay the previous evening was 69-year-old Scriber Mayor Dave Hamilton. The collision occurred shortly before 7.30 west of the Little Pick River Bridge. An OPP release states officers found a tractor-trailer unit in the eastbound ditch and a pickup truck in the westbound lane against the guardrails. Hamilton was the sole occupant of the pickup truck and was pronounced deceased at the scene. Hamilton spent six years as a councillor before successfully earning the mayor's seat in 2018. He served on many boards and committees, including the Thunder Bay District Board of Health and the Thunder Bay District Municipal League. Marathon Mayor and TBDML President Rick Dumas confirmed Hamilton had been attending a league meeting in Marathon Saturday. He says he got to know Hamilton very well over the last decade, adding they both shared a common bond of caring about and being involved in their communities. I've known Dave for a lot of years as, uh, as a councillor and then, of course, the mayor and uh, Schreiber. Uh, throughout our, our different uh, meetings uh, with Thunder Bay District and Simba League, as well as NOMA, you know, meeting in Toronto, meeting as local mayors here regionally and throughout the North Shore. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a really devastating blow to the community of Schreiber, as well as to the district, and, you know, uh, uh, just going to miss uh, Dave completely. Similar sentiments were expressed by many of Hamilton's colleagues, including neighbouring Terrace Bay Mayor Jody Davis, who had known Hamilton for over three decades. He was a proud husband, father and grandfather valued and respected leader of his town and in the district. He will be missed. We will miss you, David. Hamilton leaves behind a wife, a son, a daughter, and two grandsons. An investigation into the crash is still ongoing, with possible charges pending. Adam Riley, TBT News.
An update to that story. In late November, the Ontario Provincial Police announced a charge of dangerous driving causing death against the 35-year-old driver of the transport. When we come back, racism in Kenora spikes following outbreaks of COVID-19 on area First Nations and Beardmore residents fight back against proposed cuts to EMS. Numbers of active COVID-19 cases continued to rise in February, many of which were as a result of outbreaks on area First Nations. Some of those infected ended up self-isolating at hotels in Kenora. It was there where the Ontario Provincial Police were forced to counter social media posts that claimed members of the Wabasimung First Nation were breaking health guidelines. Those posts were also shared by an area activist who called them racist in nature, and that not only harmed the community dealing with an outbreak, but also every Indigenous resident in Kenora. Avery McRae had the details. The series of posts and comments in the Facebook group Kenora Rant and Rave made on February 19th targeted members of Wabsamong, claiming people from the reserve north of the city have been ignoring COVID isolation rules and going into grocery stores and spitting on fresh produce. Kenora OPP Inspector Jeff Duggan says they've received no reports of anything of that nature and says the posters are spreading flat-out lies. The stuff on social media, it, it's false. Uh, I mean, it, it's just not true. And it's very harmful to relationships as well. Um, you know, when people make false accusations or, or make, make stuff up, basically. Her misinformation about spitting on produce caused a lot of uh, hardship for not just people of Wabsamung, but anyone that, of, of, that's Indigenous here in the community. Cameron called out the two posters online and shared the inflammatory post. She later removed their names following a call from the OPP who said one of the posters had received death threats. That's an ongoing investigation, and I, I don't want to speak about ongoing investigations. Indigenous Affairs Minister Mark Miller weighed in on the incident, saying the ignorant and bigoted behavior must end and that Canadians are better than this. Cameron agrees that the two communities should be coming together to support one another during these trying times. Where compassion and care is needed, I simply just use my voice to, to call out racism and to say that um, those views that they're putting out in social media is doing more damage than they could ever imagine. And a lot of the local leadership has really stepped up to support our communities. And we need to keep that going. 
And, uh, you know, we can't make assumptions. We, we can't deny service because we're making assumptions. Uh, it, it just can't happen. It, it's not where we want to go and it's not where we want to be. Avery McRae, TBT News. Residents of Beardmore and the surrounding area rallied in early March in protest of a plan that would see the EMS station in that community close. Demonstrators said the move would put lives at risk and drive away anyone looking to put down roots in the area. At the same time, their concerns were compounded by a lack of consultation by consultants hired by Thunder Bay City Council. To have an ambulance come from Geraldton or Nipigon, that's over a two and a half hour round trip to get to hospital. That is not acceptable. Those are the concerns held by residents of Beardmore and the surrounding First Nations should the 10 year strategic plan for Superior North EMS be implemented by Thunder Bay City Council. Close to 50 people, all socially distanced, rallied in support of the ambulance base that would be shuttered as a result of the plan. Beardmore Ward Councillor Claudette Trottier says the closure would not only have a devastating impact on seniors, it would also spell certain doom for her ward. They have at least some security of getting to a hospital in time if they need it. If we lose our ambulance services here, good luck ever attracting anybody to the community. It's a vital service and we can't do without it. It's people's lives. The closure would also have serious implications for several First Nations in the area, including Rocky Bay, Bingwe Niashi Anishinaabek, and Inibigu Zagagan Anishinaabek. Newly elected BNA Chief Paul Gladu says having an ambulance within 20 minutes of his community is critical for community members. It's needed. Uh, this, this ambulance is very important to the to people that's living in the surrounding communities. I mean, we have one band member that is, she's sitting right here. That it's over, since 2017, she's used it 200 times, she said. Last summer, nearby AZA First Nation began planting roots for a new community near Jellico with the installation of a power line to help service 20 new homes. AZA Chief Teresa Nelson says the decision to close Beardmore is confusing considering all the development and concerning due to the lack of consultation in the Robinson Superior region. It's outrageous. It's, it's just unheard of nowadays. Uh, and for them to do something like that over a budget call, I mean, there's so many other options that they could have done. They could have came to us and said, you know what, uh, the budget is tight due to whatever. They could have made up any excuse. It's unbelievable. It, it just almost brings us back into the the treaty days almost where they didn't even consider talking to us. Thunder Bay City Council will vote on the implementation of the 10-year strategic plan for EMS in April. Adam Riley, TBT News. It's not uncommon for traffic on the Trans-Canada Highway to stop in northwestern Ontario due to a collision, inclement weather, or rare, on the rare occasion a washout. But in March, traffic on Highway 17A near Kenora was brought to a screeching halt due to an obstacle that appeared to come straight out of an episode of Looney Tunes, when a massive boulder ended up in the middle of the highway while crews were blasting rocks on March 4th. Thankfully, no injuries occurred when the 400 cubic meter rock mass slid onto the highway. The Ministry of Transportation confirmed the highway had already been closed for planned blasting, and it remained that way until 6 o'clock that evening, when a single lane was able to be reopened to traffic. The MTO says the rock well exceeded the capabilities of all available removal equipment, so explosives were used to chip it down to a manageable size. A 26-year-old Winnipeg resident was charged with murder after a, after a victim of a serious assault and robbery later died of her injuries. The incident took place on March 18th when OPP were called to a 7th Avenue residence in Sioux Lookout. There they found the victim, 37-year-old Robin Kakapitam of Sioux Lookout, with life-threatening injuries. Tyler Colley of Winnipeg was then re-arrested with the added offence of second-degree murder. Ontario Provincial Police and the Office of the Fire Marshal were called to investigate a tragic house fire in Geraldton in early March, which claimed the life of a two-year-old boy. The fire levelled the home on Sear Way on the night of March 11th. Several adults and children managed to escape the blaze, but the young boy could not be saved. A GoFundMe was set up to assist the family dealing with the loss of the boy named Phoenix, and it managed to raise more than $19,000 within a week. The OPP's Forensic Identification Unit was brought in and was later joined by an investigator with the Ontario Fire Marshal's Office to examine the scene. Greenstone OPP state a post-mortem was conducted as part of the investigation. Less than a month later, fire crews responded to an early morning house fire in Nikina, which would also claim the life of, a man in the aftermath, uh, of the man. 
In the aftermath of the two fires, Greenstone Mayor Renel Beaulieu stated the fire department would be conducting a community-wide fire safety blitz in an effort to prevent more fires and save lives. Coming up after the break, Marathon records its first COVID-19 death and officers with the Ontario Provincial Police are kicked out of Pekanjikum. An outbreak of COVID-19 at Wilson Memorial Hospital in Marathon took a turn for the worse in late March when the town recorded its first COVID-related death. The death marked the 40th COVID-related death in the district and the first along the North Shore. It was first confirmed by the Marathon Family Health Team and was linked to the outbreak in the hospital's chronic care wing, which had grown to seven cases, with the virus being found in both staff and patients. North of Superior Healthcare Group CEO Adam Brown was saddened by the death, calling it demoralizing for both the family and the staff at the hospital. We've been working so hard for the last year to keep everybody safe, and that's our job is to keep everybody safe. And we, we have this death, and then I, I try to reconcile it with what I've seen and, and heard in the community over the weekend of a lot of travel to the city for non-essential reasons. Uh, I've heard lots of uh, parties and yards over the weekend. So quite demoralizing, honestly, and hopefully a reminder and uh, uh, that something positive can come out of this to, to snap us back into our reality. Both the chief of the Pekanjikum First Nation and the main spokesperson for the Ontario Provincial Police spoke out in late March following a shocking turn of events that saw the provincial police force expelled from the community due to allegations of misconduct by officers. In a Facebook video, Chief Dean Owen addressed members of his community speaking mostly in Ojibwe. The community also issued a release stating that trust was now broken between the two organizations and that Pekanjikum needs to know about the potential threats in their community, especially when that threat comes from the people they entrust to protect their members. Owen says the incidents date back many years and were left unresolved and required immediate attention by the government to discuss the next steps to ensure the community's safety. Serious misconduct. Yeah, I can involves the with physical assault, sexual assault, digging in my heels. I know I see I'm not going to let this one go by. The 10 LPD members actually returned to their home locations on Friday of last week. 
Now, due to allegations of misconduct involving OPP members, the OPP has proactively reached out to the Ontario Special Investigations Unit, which has invoked its mandate to investigate. Now, as a result of that invocation, the OPP can't comment any farther on those allegations. There were also concerns about the community of 3,000 being without 24-7 health care as a result of Indigenous Services Canada flying nurses out each night in response to further concerns of a lack of policing. Officers would later be allowed to re resume policing duties in late April with several conditions that included wor that officers work alongside the Pekanjikum Peacekeepers, a volunteer group fo formed following the absence of the formal police service. As April began to draw to a close, the family of Hermina Fletcher and her estate launched a multi-million dollar lawsuit against Riverside Healthcare and a former nurse who was facing murder charges in connection to Fletcher's death. The 76-year-old woman died at La Verandre Hospital in January of 2015. More than four years later, the OPP charged 36-year-old Lindsay Coyle with second-degree murder, breach of trust and theft. The statement of claims sought out $3 million in total damages, alleging negligence and infliction of emotional distress. The suit claims Coyle stole Fletcher's medication and falsified prescription records, leading to suffering and eventual death. It also alleges the hospital failed to monitor Fletcher's condition or investigate evidence of medication theft and then hid the truth about what happened from the family. None of the allegations have been proven in court. And those were some of our top stories from January to April. Tune in next time when we recap the months of May, June, July and August. Thank you and have a great weekend.